The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome, everyone, to the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to uh, visit us at any time, it's exxonradiotv.com. And for the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, we're coming to you on the Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, and on Channel 32 on Simul TV at www.simultv.com. My guess this hour is no stranger to anyone who watches uh, Simul TV Channel 32 or listens to the X Zone or who loves reading about UFOs, crashes, and has been a guest on every uh, paranormal talk radio show going. And, and he's got a show here on the X Zone Broadcast Network. I'm talking about Kevin Randall. And uh, Kevin, Good well, seeing you, buddy. Yeah, it's good seeing you. Been a long time. It ha- it has it has, my friend. And and I must say, Kevin, that since you and I last talked, there's been a lot of stuff going on within the UFO community. This guy David Grush, for example, uh, a whistleblower. What do you make about him? I have concerns because we don't have a lot of information that we can vet. Mm-hmm. He talks about I he, that he had uh, met with a number of people or heard stories from a number of people that he trusts about crash retrievals. He talks about possible documentation. He talks about all kinds of things like that, but he presents us with nothing we can check. We don't get names. We don't get locations. We don't get dates. In one of the interviews, he dropped the uh, idea of this crash in 1933 in Italy. Mm-hmm. Uh, anybody who's been around the field for a long time knows that that's a hoax. Uh, my colleagues in in um, Italy, in, in Europe, um, Eduardo Russo, for example, has uh, said for 20 years this thing was a hoax. The idea was that Mussolini had captured a flying saucer. They, they retrieved the flying saucer. The Vatican was involved. The Pope didn't want the fascists to have it. And somehow the, the Americans ended up with it. There's documentation that smacks like something right out of the MJ-12 playbook. Mm-hmm that cannot be corroborated. The um, archives listed as places where you could find this stuff don't exist. Some of the people don't exist. There's a real problem with that. And, and I'm thinking, well, if this guy is touting that as one of the better of the cases, what uh, what has he been talking about? I did a blog piece. Uh, I just put it up a couple of hours ago, as a matter of fact, about this um, called... Um, well, that's the number one on my blog. It's um, about crash retrievals and me. I think it's talking about that sort of thing. But what I did was I'd gone back through some of the stuff that Don Schmidt, Tom Carey, and I had uh, mm-hmm. um, written about on, on this particular topic, Roswell specifically, where we name names. We give dates. We give locations. And in the blog posting, I put pictures of the people that we had talked to and what they had said about this whole thing. And it doesn't matter which side of the fence you come down on in this particular case. I'm reporting on what these people told me. Is it accurate? Is it good information? I think it is. But the point is, I've given you the names. I've given you the locations. I've given you the dates. I've given you the sources. I've pro- uh, provided the transcripts of the tapes, which I have have the tapes, all leading to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And what we have from David Crush is none of that. He just talks about, well, you know, there's been 12 crashes and they retrieved bodies or they may have mm-hmm. retrieved bodies and won't give us a lot of specifics that we can check into. I saw another interview with... Um, one of the reporters that had interviewed him talking about how he supposedly had been um, sworn to or sworn under oath to tell the truth uh, in meetings with the congressional representatives or, or uh, Senate committees. Turns out he hasn't met with any senators at all. He's met with representatives of the senators, the senator staff. Mm-hmm. He may have appeared in a um, in front of a congressional panel at some point, but I don't know any of the details about that. We really don't have much of that on that. So we don't know if he was uh, sworn in. 
to tell the truth. We don't know anything about that. And all we get are promises about what's going to come in the future. I am hopeful that what he's saying is the truth and it will be borne out in the future. But until we get to that point, we have to be very cautious and very skeptical of what's being said. What danger does he pose to the UFO community? He is getting an awful lot of interest from the mainstream media, which mm -hmm. is kind of frightening given their attitudes. I know when Don Schmidt and I were going to meet with um, reporters for the Chicago Tribune, it ended up we were met in the hallway by an intern who told us that the editors just didn't believe this stuff and didn't want to hear about it. But they did meet with us and we did chat with them about it. I don't know what the story was when they finally did it. But if it blows up in um, our faces, which it can, it's going to be kind of like Condon Committee 3.0, which means simply for a long time uh, after the Condon Committee report, that was the University of Colorado study in the late 1960s, it concluded there was nothing to this. For a long time after that, the go-to position of the skeptical community, and somewhat rightly so, was, well, the scientific community investigated this and they found there was nothing to it. In the interim, the last 50 years, we have um, gotten access to files, to letters, to documentation that shows us that the content committee was a put-up job, that the Air Force wanted out of the UFO investigation. And there was an Air Force officer named Hitler who wrote to um, members of the content committee, says, here's what we'd like you to find. We'd like you to find the Air Force had done a good job. There's nothing to this. And the Air Force should get out of the job of investigating UFOs. And lo and behold, 18 months later, what did they find? Those three things, but, they, things, but they'd agreed to it prior to the um, beginning of the investigation. The Roswell case, which I think is a very strong case, given the number of witnesses, given the interaction with the environment, given the hints that Air Force officers were involved, given the sheriff's report of what he'd seen, very strong case. They um, devoted one or two lines to it, which was saying, well, basically, the, we couldn't get a hold of the cars, which were supposedly stalled at level land. We couldn't do any of the investigation, so we didn't do anything with it. And we can think of no way in which a um, electromagnetic field could suppress the car engine and then remove that field and the car engine would, res would sp uh, restart spontaneously. And I thought, well, there's a darn good question. Let's look into that. So I went through some probably five or 600 reports of um, UFOs interfering with the operation of vehicles. Mark Roderick had done a long report on that. Mm -hmm. And there's other sources that I was able to access. And I found out in the vast majority of the cases, the, the, the witness did not report the car starting spontaneously, but that the witness took some action. And they would say things like, once the UFO was gone, the car started normally. Well, did you twist the, uh, the key? Did you have any did you do anything to make the car start only in a couple of the cases did the witness suggest the the vehicle had started spontaneously so their rejection of the level land type cases with stalled cars was not adequately researched so i look at all of that stuff but the, the point simply is even with um that the the condon committee report kind of suppressed UFO information for a long time because that was the go-to point. The scientific investigation didn't find anything to, to UFOs. And if this blows up, I fear that we're going to be, well, you know, we had this, all this stuff about this whistleblower and it turned out um, there was some problems with his testimony. Is it possible, Kevin, that this is the result of the American military wearing uh, mud on their face after the Chinese balloon fiascos that they needed to do something. They needed to, to, you know, to get a, a distraction from that and put it back on UFOs. Like many people believe they did going back to the Roswell days. I don't think that the Chinese balloon fiasco, and that's a good term for it, by the way, <laughs> um, really had anything to do with this because this predated that. And, and but so, his his media exposure predated the. Um, oh, I'm sorry, but I, yeah. I was thinking in terms of this push for more information that goes back to. No, the, no I'm talking about David Grush coming out and all this whistleblowing yeah. after the after the Chinese balloon fiasco. In intelligence, if you discover a leak, mm -hmm. the thing you do is pump the leak with bad information to discredit all the information. 
And that might be the case here. Well, we the, the leak is the Chinese balloon fiasco and we pump this information out there. Now everybody's distracted talking about UFOs or as they insist on calling them UAPs. Um, and we seem to be getting more interest. But I sat in on the, um, when uh, Sean Kilpatrick, Kirkpatrick sat in front of the Senate committee. Uh, it was the chairman of the committee, the senator from Iowa, Joni Ernst, and I think one other person sitting there questioning this guy. And you've got this huge room and you've got this table with all these seats. And there's a picture of, uh, of it on my blog, as a matter of fact, uh, talking about this. But they never got into the substance. It was about the logistics. It was about the problems. It's about we're doing this. We're doing that. We've looked at this many cases. We've done this. But there was no specifics. I sat on an, in on the... Um, NASA panel, which anybody could have done, of course, because it was all over the internet. And it sure. was the same sort of thing. It was just a lot of the logistics and what we're going to do and what we're going to do this about this. It wasn't anything about um, the investigations. Who are the investigators? What are they doing? What have they found? Well, what else is in the files? I think if you go back to the Project Blue Book files and you go through those carefully, you're going to find a lot of spectacular cases. I just... Um, talked about, not recently talked about the um, case from Austin, Texas, one of the last in, unidentifieds in the Project Blue Book files. What happened there was uh, a guy had a, a sighting. Um, he was in sight for 10 minutes. It was a cigar-shaped craft. He said that um, he'd stopped. He, he was watching it. He flashed the only code he could think, which was 3.14. And I'm thinking, great, if the aliens are using base 10 for their mathematical <laughs> calculations and if they're not the 3.14 might not mean anything to them but um the uh, um, air force investigators an officer came out they filled out their ridiculously long and, and uncomplicated form uh, and the air force wrote it off as insufficient data for scientific analysis well he got angry and wrote to him as what more data could you possibly want uh, we filled out your form. The lieutenant, his name yeah. was Foreman, by the way, filled it out as completely as he could. Uh, I don't know what more I could tell you about this. And they finally identified, re-categorized um, it as unidentified. But the point is they, the first inclination was put it in insufficient data for scientific analysis. And when you look at that, I estimate there's four to 5,000 cases in the Blue Book files that are insufficient data. That's not a solution. That's a categorization that gets it away from the dreaded unidentified category. And I think that's you know, one of the things that we, we need to look at. There's good history here if we go back and we research it carefully. If, in fact, the, the information that David Grush was spreading with the media, would it not make sense that if it was true that the government would, in fact, throw it under national security and cause a media blackout? Well, in um, this country, that'd be very difficult to do especially with the information that's come out. They have to be very careful on that respect because if they push too hard in that direction, then yeah. sometimes reporters actually do their jobs and do investigative journalism and cause more trouble than it's, than it's, uh, than it's worth. But I think, I think that um, the problem here is he's not given us anything to really work with. He's talking about people that he's, he's talked to. Eichmann can make the same claims. Yeah. And that doesn't really get us any further along. I've talked to people who handled the debris. I've talked to people who claimed they saw the alien bodies. I mean, that puts me that much closer to the, the central core. Now, were those people lying to me? Well, some of them were, as a matter of fact, and we discovered that and we outed them as soon as we found out that the information they were supplying wasn't credible. We made sure that everybody understood that, which has come back to haunt me uh, a number of times, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Hey, Kevin, I hate to do this to you, my friend. You, we've got to take a commercial break. I believe your blog spot is kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. Jeez, I wonder why I keep on remembering that one. <laughs> Kevin Randall, great seeing you, my friend. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. And uh, Kevin and I will return on the other side of this break as the Exxon continues with yours truly, Rob McConnell, from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario. Check us out online at www.exxonradiotv.com. Welcome back, everyone. KevinRandall.blogspot.com is the website for the gentleman who you see with me here on the screen tonight, my good friend Kevin Randall. Uh, Kevin, why would a whistleblower blow his whistle if he's taking an oath to keep secrets? I have no idea. I think there's a point mm -hmm. where... I think the whistleblower allegedly sees something that 
he or she believes is wrong and feels it necessary to communicate it to some other authority. And, and oftentimes that's, that's a good thing, but there's others who uh, are labeled as whistleblowers. I mean, all we know right now is that we are hearing rumors, things that he overheard, things that people told him about, but he hasn't presented any evidence. So what kind of whistleblowing is that? I think he was uh, he was annoyed that he's heard these stories about UFO crashes and that the arrow, the um, the new acronym for the investigation of UFOs, they don't have didn't have any information on this or access to that information. And he thought that was something that should be in their purview, which which, of course, if they're investigating mm-hmm. UFO cra- uh, UFOs or UAPs or whatever in uh, over the United States, that should be information they should have. The, the historical aspect of it should be there. So that's that would be one of the reasons you'd have a whistleblower doing something like that. But and Jerry Clark uh, um, warned me about being too pessimistic about this. Uh, you know, we really need more information before we can draw a complete and total conclusion about what he's saying and how valid it is. But the little bit of information we have leads me into the direction that suggests maybe this isn't as uh, outstanding, isn't as exciting as is being made out to be in, in the media. I watched a reporter where he was talking about, he mentioned, or one of his cohorts mentioned that there might have been um, crew recovered. And she said, well, she doesn't send chills down my spine. It shivers and chills, chills, chills down my <laughs> spine. Um hearing this. And I'm thinking, good Lord, Don Schmidt and I were talking about this 30 years ago. It didn't send shivers down anybody's spine then. And they just relegated us to the tinfoil hat brigade type thing. They're too sophisticated being in UFOs. Um, we go through this periodically where somebody comes out and looks like it's going to be blowing the lid off everything. And then the lid clamps back down. Uh, John Greenwald just put up a piece, I think a week ago last Monday, where he mentioned that some of the um, exception, exceptions to the FOIA request, the Freedom of Information request, um, have been um, strengthened, making it more difficult to get FOIA requests on certain aspects of this stuff. Rather than moving toward open transparency, we're moving a little bit away from that. And this might be a whole way of kind of blunting the disclosure brigade by putting this stuff out here, and then suddenly we get no further. We can learn nothing more about it. So it's just, uh, well, it's just a bunch of rumors and we don't need to pay any attention to it. If, uh, if, if in fact, this information that David Grush has is legitimate, wouldn't Congress move faster in getting into these, uh, these, these investigations that they're supposed to be getting into in order to find out who, what, when, where, why, and how? Oh, they're too busy investigating Trump to see if he colluded with the Russians on the 2016 election. I mean, we're still getting information on that now that we've mm. got all these other diversions as well. And I, I would other the other thing I would I would suggest that some of these investigations that Congress and the Senate are supposedly engaging in are 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 critical to the functioning of this country. And discovering whether or not alien visitation is real isn't among them because you look at the whole history. We can go back 75 years. Right. We can go back to the Roswell case. We can go back to the Foo Fighters of the Second World War. And say this is where the modern era began and now here we are in 2023 and that has not adversely affected life on the planet earth in any way shape or form so if why should i worry about alien visitation when it hasn't affected my my life at all um that sort of thing so i I think we've got to take a look at that i i wondered back in um the carter administration if you remember the um the, the hostage situation that took place at the end of the Carter administration for yep. what 18 months or whatever it was. If that wasn't a diversion to keep Carter away from worrying about UFOs and flying sausage, because you remember Carter made a campaign promise as has others yeah. that we would get the information about UFOs. Well, nothing ever came out. And uh, I, I did a book called UFOs in the deep state looking at that. And well, why don't we know more about this? And I think the answer is it's all about the power. And if you talk too much about UFOs, if there really is alien visitation and you talk too much about it, your power may be um, diffused. And so it's about the power and the money. Um, Dan Sheehan, who is a lawyer, uh, 
told me, and I, I, I recount this in the book, told me that he had been asked by Carter to take a look at some of the UFO stuff. And he um, saw the secret Project Blue Book files are part of them that showed showed uh, photographs of a crash saucer and that sort mm-hmm. of thing. But more importantly, Sheehan was telling me that um, when Carter met with uh, George H.W. Bush, who at the time was the director of central intelligence, and they're discussing all these sorts of things, and, and Bush said to him, I would like to remain as the director of central intelligence when you take over. And Carter said, well, I, I'm bringing in my own guy. And then the topic moved to UFOs and Carter asked him something about UFOs. And he said, well, I can't, uh, I can't tell you about that. It's highly classified. You're not the president yet. Here's the guy who's going to become president. And right. the director of central intelligence said, well, I'm not going to discuss that with you. And I think the other thing, the other dodge they use is, well, gee, Mr. President, this there are all sorts of agencies involved in this investigation. And what we have to take a look at, we have to pull all this information together and we'll get you a comprehensive report. And somehow that report never gets to them. And that's what we've been seeing for the last, what, two, two and a half years. We're going to investigate this. We've created how many offices to investigate? We're going to have congressional hearings. We've had how many of those? And we've gotten absolutely nothing. If, if Carter asked Bush about the UFO uh, question and Bush said, well, no, too bad. You're not president yet. Why didn't the person that president Carter installed as the director of the CIA find out the information that the president wanted and report back to the president? Like to me, that seems like a no brainer. Well, I think what happened is once the, once Carter took over president, you've got to, you've got to realize it's going to be a horrendous job to move into and UFOs will be moving down the list mm-hmm. of priorities of course. And I think, like I said, I think if he asked, I would like to know about these UFOs. And the answer is, you've got to remember that that the appointees at the top, the very top of the various agencies or, or organizations are government or uh, presidential appointees. But the next level are bureaucrats that go from administration to administration to administration. And there's where some of the real power resides. And so when you ask that sort of question, the new the new director would probably say, what can you tell me about these UFOs? And it's the same thing. We've got to pull all this information together and we'll get it for you. And somehow that information never gets pulled together. Something diverts that attention. Something happens. And that was why I mentioned the hostage crisis. You know, that diverted his attention for a long time. Uh, other presidents had no interest in this sort of thing. Um, uh, I don't think um, George W. Bush cared. I don't think uh, uh, Donald Trump cared uh, about flying saucers mm-hmm. or UFOs. So I think that's the other part of the problem. The the the, the new president, I, I, I guess we could say we kind of overthrow our government every four years or eight years, depending on, on the elections. But we, we, we keep replacing our government that way. And what is a priority for one government certainly isn't a priority for the next government. I mean, look at look at the things that... Um, that Biden has done that yeah. were a priority for the um, the Trump administration, and he countered a lot of that stuff. So we we kind of uh, overthrow our government every four years. So that the way this stuff gets married. Plus, we had the idea. Um, I had done a, a science fiction story or a horror story where the um, there's a real live, honest to goodness pa- vampire. Probably should say a real dead vampire, and uh, the person who's discovered the the identity says, well, I'm going to tell the public about you. And the vampire says, go ahead. Nobody will believe you anyway. And I think that's kind of where we are on UFOs. Well, go ahead mm-hmm. and tell them. Nobody's going to believe you anyway. They say, well, this stuff would have leaked out if it had been done. It's been leaking for, with us, uh, Don Schmidt, yeah. my investigation has been leaking for 30 years and nothing gets done because the journalists and everybody's too sophisticated to believe in flying saucers. But is it also possible, Kevin, that the number of woo-woos that are out there who make all these fantastic claims that cannot be substantiated. Like uh, there was uh, somebody on another show that our network does where they were saying there's over 85 different types of aliens that are visiting us on this planet that are residing with us. Uh, Ladies are getting fetuses taken out of their wombs and later on they're beamed up to a mothership where they interact with their child. Uh, There's so many questions and, how do these people who make these wild claims, how do, how do they fit into the grand scheme of how John Q. Public starts looking at the UFO community? There seems to be no consistency 
And if these were real events, would there not be more consistency with the reportings as well as the the sightings and the type of saucers or the type of craft? Like it seems that they're all over the board. That's one of the big problems. And we have to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's the right. problem we all run into. You know, we've got all the people out there telling these stories. John Max said at one time, being an abductee is not a club you'd want to join. And I'm thinking it's absolutely a club these people want to join because it mm -hmm. gives them a sense of community. It gives them a sense of brotherhood. I am a duck abductee and all these are all my friends who are abductees and we bond over that sort of thing. So it's truly a club. We have the researchers like John Mack and, and uh, Bud Hopkins, who I think um, to be fair to them were unconsciously um, in, in, impressing their abductees with their own yeah. uh, research conclusions. And and John Mack actually said a number of times that he was stuck struck by the idea that um, the abductees seemed to find the researcher whose uh, research validates their, their experience. John Mack got the aliens with uh, uh, an Eastern philosophy and, and Bud Hopkins got the cold calculating scientists and uh, um, uh, David Jacobs, I'm going to say David Temple, he taught at Temple University. David Jacobs got the um, uh, the, hi the hybrids with the, with the idea of, of invading the earth. And it was, mm -hmm. they get their own thing. And you take a look at their transcripts and you can see, if you're looking for it, you can see the subtle influence the researcher, the operator, the hypnotist uh, exerts on the people. So we have that problem to deal with. Uh, so you have to take a look at all of that. But and, and that's what I'm saying. We had uh, the, the I think the electromagnetic effects might be a, a good way to go with this. There's okay. a lot of consistency inside those reports, but it's a small part of the overall UFO community. But we take a look at what happens with those people. And then we have to deal with the people who are just making it up. They yeah. get their names in the newspaper. And sometimes their stories are spectacular and they want to... Uh, or, or they've they've influenced the direction of research for a long time. We had to deal with the MJ-12 documents that I, I'm absolutely convinced the researcher. I, in fact, I know that the, the person who released it, uh, Bill Moore, had said to a number of different people, he was thinking of creating a Roswell-like document because he'd run into a brick wall in his investigation. He thought if there was these documents out there that people who'd been involved at Roswell might be more uh, more talkative about what they had seen. I wasn't going to say reticent to talk. That's what right. they to break through. But the documents, uh, he hinted about creating a document. Lo and behold, uh, you know, a few months later, uh, 18 months later, he's got the MJ-12 documents. And that that diverted his research for a long time. I think the majority of the UFO uh, population community now understands that the MJ-12 documents are a hoax. But I still get arguments from people about those sorts of things. And mm -hmm. um or arguments about the Aztec case, or um, you know, did you did you think about this? Did you think about that? You just had a Canadian um, minister uh, uh, send a letter to the Can Canadian government about you've got to look at this stuff seriously because you know you want to get caught up in the the mystique of the with the United States. Uh, it was a big deal a couple of weeks ago. And he referenced this 1950 stuff. And I'm thinking that could be Wilbert. Uh, Wilbur Smith. Yes. And yeah. uh, Robert Sawbacher. Yeah. And, and that stuff. And I, I looked at that and I said, yeah, we, but Sawbacher, who verified the UFO flying saucer stuff uh, and, and said behind the flying saucers, which was the book about the Aztec case or part of part of the book about the Aztec case um, was thoroughly debunked. And yet we're still we're still dealing with that from 1950. So it's crazy. Uh, hey, Kev, stand by. We've got to take our break, please. Uh, don't go anywhere. Stay seated. No, no, stay seated. No need to stand up. Exonation. Nation, our guest is Kevin Randall, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And we'll be back on the other side as we continue this fascinating conversation with our good friend. And you can listen to Kevin's uh, replays and archives at www.xzbn.net. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Kevin Randall and I return on the other side of this break. Don't go away. 
Just a couple of things to uh, bring to your attention, Explanation. I was advised earlier today that there was problems with our stream at xzbn.net. That was due to uh, a problem with our servers in the United Kingdom. That problem has been rectified. Everything is back running up at xzbn.net, where you can listen to the Exxon Broadcast Network and a lot of our shows with our compliments. That gentleman you see on your screen, Kevin Randall, he's got his own show up there. A different perspective and once again his um, blogspot is kevinrandall.blogspot.com kevin uh is, is it possible that we're looking at the wrong way to look for the evidence of ufos as well as the extraterrestrial uh, visitors that are coming here why do we expect them to be uh, carbon-based units and why you know how do we why do we expect their science to be like our science that we can actually understand why you know who what when where why it seems that there's a lot of people who are putting too much of the human factor into this entire equation there is some of that i think part of the problem goes back to the uh, science fiction movies of the 1930s 1940s Whenever they showed an alien, it was always uh, a human in some kind of strange costume, things like yeah. that. And I think we've been kind of conditioned to that throughout the, the history of, um, of, of our, our media, simply because it's only recently that the capability to create really obnoxious looking aliens has um, been available to to um, Hollywood and the other filmmakers. I think that's part of the problem. And I think that we all look at uh, the idea that uh, intelligence is going to evolve in a certain way mm -hmm. that you need you need the uh, two eyes for the stereoscopic vision you need an opposable thumb so you can grasp things um yeah, i don't I'm sure about walking upright as a necessary uh, con contributor to intelligence but i think we look at, at our our evolution and kind of apply it there i've also said repeatedly that if uh, um, my example used to be wonderful because it worked quite well that if you took a VCR and a uh, TV and a mon TV monitor and a power pack back to Merlin the Magician and showed it to him and he got this black ribbon, the videotape, and if you know the secrets, you can get sound and color pictures off it and say, okay, here it is duplicated. And to do that, he would have to understand two things that are invisible, magnetism and electricity, which of course right. at that time frame, they didn't understand that. I think that if we're dealing with an alien race and they've had, they've, they've discovered a way of traveling the interstellar distances, which we can't do. And we talk theoretically on ways of doing it, but we really don't have the means to do it at this point. I don't know when we'll, we'll get the means. Although that kind of reminds me, and uh, if you remember the movie Forbidden Planet, at the beginning as they're introducing it, they say um, men from Earth first reached the moon at the end of the 21st century. Well, um, it was like 15 years later from that movie that we actually got onto the moon. So our science does progress. But I think an alien science would be so far superior to ours mm -hmm. that, as Arthur C. Clarke said, it would be like magic to us. It just would seem like magic. And I think that's where we are. Uh, there's, there's, as I said, I think there's, there's discussions about parallel evolution, that the similar conditions on planets would give rise to intelligence that would have some of the attributes that we have. But there have been some cases where the aliens described don't look very human. They're not very humanoid at all. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that, that we have been conditioned to think that way. And there's been discussion in the UFO community on the possibility of silicon-based life mm -hmm. forms, opposed to carbon-based life form and things like that. But I would say I think the, the, the physics of the universe probably are uh, the same throughout our entire universe. The physical laws that we operate under here on Earth probably exist throughout our galaxy and then the rest of the universe as well. So that may be maybe some of it as well. So I guess we can say that the way that we um, anticipate seeing an extraterrestrial would be like the uh, Santa Claus syndrome because Santa Claus looks the same, even though Santa Claus has never really existed. Well, because people have been, been pushing that. Yeah. I think that the idea of the small gray aliens was pushed 
particularly after um, some of the abduction cases, I, I think Whitley Strieber kind of set that in, in uh, people's minds. But if you go to Europe or you go to Africa or you go to Asia and you talk to people who are talking about having been abducted, oftentimes the aliens don't look anything like what's reported in the United States or in the North American continent. They're, they're different. They're a lot different. And we have, we have uh, cases of the aliens looking really bizarre. Um, some of the stuff out of South America, though, looks like the uh, aliens from science fiction movies, which kind of cracks me up. <laughs> As something else that, that has gone by the by, you and I have talked about cattle mutilations. We've talked about uh, a lot of different aspects. But somebody was uh, sending us a bunch of information over the last couple of weeks about these underground bases uh, where the alien... Yeah, and, I, and it's like, oh, come on. Here we go again. The merry-go-round, right? Absolutely. And it, it, it becomes full circle. Yeah, I the underground base ideas... Ridiculous. I remember I was in Mesa, Arizona at a conference. It must have been in the uh, mid 1980s. Mm -hmm. And somebody was there talking about the underground bases and how they're all connected under, with tunnels underground and all of that sort of thing. And it, but but then nobody ever comes up with the pictures. Nobody ever has any evidence for this. Right. And that's one of the problems. I can understand if you're you're dealing with an alien spacecraft that he is is in sight for five or ten minutes, or it's mm -hmm. it's landed and left a burned area and it's gone. That there's not a whole lot you can gather in the way of information, but there is some traces there. There's some evidence there. Um, but but with a, a lot of this stuff, there's just not the kind of, of evidence you'd expect. You mentioned cattle mutilations. And the one thing that always right. cracked me up is uh, I've, I've seen this picture a number of times of a cow laying in a field that has been partially mutilated. And they say, you see, there's no footprints of the scavengers around it. And I'm thinking, yeah, look at all the bird droppings on the carcass. That might be a hint <laughs> right there. Uh, what happened? And and and. and it, they would talk about upside mutilations, meaning the the side it's laying on, right. predators couldn't get to it to to attack, and it's always the soft tissues as well. I was challenged once when somebody, somebody said, "Well, when we we've, we've analyzed some of the animals, you know, there's an extreme lack of copper in the blood. How do you explain that?" And I thought, "Well, there's a darn good question," and thank you, internet, because I could answer it. I discovered that copper deficiency in cattle is a real problem. And that the, often the the ranchers provide copper supplements to their to their animals. And once a, a cow is given birth, for example, the copper levels in that animal are extremely low. And so the answer to the question is that's a, an environmental problem that can be rectified with the proper uh, supplements. Yeah, well, uh, just like us who need to take vitamins, multivitamins, or iron pills, or whatever, uh, Kevin. Uh, with your ear to the ground, uh, have you heard of any new exciting UFO cases? Well, there's some, there's some interesting stuff going on, but it's the problem is we're running into the same problem we've had for literally decades, and that's figuring out where the good cases are from the bad mm -hmm. ones. Uh, Fran Ridge does something called MADAR, which is a, um, a multi-detector for looking for anomalous spikes in the environment and then try to match those to UFO sightings. Somebody has a UFO sighting at a certain time in a certain location. They look at the MADAR center around that and see if there are some uh, changes in the electromagnetic activity, for example. And, and, and there have been some interesting correlations hmm. with the MADAR information where they would, uh, somebody will have a sighting and there'll be a corresponding spike in the electromagnetic and some of the other stuff and the compass spins suggesting, of course, the electromagnetic. So there's some very interesting things going on with that, but the sightings aren't really spectacular. It's not aliens running around loose or landing or anything like that. It's just that somebody saw something in the distance and then there was a spike at the node center. And there's been a couple of cases in which the, um, the node centers were close enough that they could get some kind of readings from two or three different node centers. I had suggested to Fran that they try to get pictures or people around uh, those node centers who would go out and look. And he said, yeah, we were, we were already doing that. And so yeah. they, they're doing that sort of thing. And I think that's a wonderful bit of, of research because if you've got a UFO sighting and you've got the instrumentality to record that independently of the sighting, and yet you can get somebody out, there, some other people out there to look at the object and maybe photograph it, then you've got a nice body of evidence. So 
that's going on. It's it's all done outside the purview of the government or the uh, the Air Force or any of the investigations going on. It's something that's being done by um, private citizens. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful project uh, that people are dedicating their resources to uh, purchasing the equipment and uh, uh, monitoring what's going on in their environment to see if there's any kind of uh, correlation. What is your take on NASA's apparent, NASA apparently showing a greater interest in the UFO UAP phenomenon? Well, I sat there and sat through most of their presentations and there just wasn't much much there at all. It's the same sort of thing. Well, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we're partnering with these people to gather this sort of data. Right. But I think in the long run, what happens is the public interest in this wanes and suddenly it just drops out of sight. The Air Force investigated UFOs for 22 years and you can see spikes in the interest where they were really trying hard. The Rupert years, for example, in the uh, 1951, 52 into 53, where he was gathering the data and they were doing legitimate investigations and all of that sort of thing. And yet pretty soon the interest changed in the Air Force and nobody mm. was doing it and they were filing the reports, throwing them away, or just not doing the follow-up investigation. So I'm just not enthusiastic about any of this because we've seen it all before. Kevin, is it possible that during the early days of ufology, going to the late 40s to the mid-50s, that the technology wasn't as attuned as it is now? And with the attunement of technology and the advancements of technology, that what could have made the UFO... Uh, claims seem more probable isn't there today because of all the modern technology we have that is basically you know trying to find out if it's true or not i'd take it a step further and i think okay. part of the problem we had in the 1940s and early 50s is the sophistication of the witnesses we weren't all geared to what's in the sky around us or what's uh, what environmental factors may produce okay. some of these effects so it's it's that what you've outlined and that as well we become more sophisticated and realize that that's a meteor uh, regardless of what you say that a meteor flying overhead can make a lot of noise yeah. uh, sonic booms and that sort of thing so yeah that's that's some of it right there and we uh, can spot that i had a guy call me one day and said you know did you see that flying saucer that came over just a few minutes ago and i see how oh, it's a sky lab i saw it or the space lab space station right international space station he had seen that and watched it across the sky and he called me and didn't realize what it was anytime venus is near the moon people are thinking that here's a spacecraft or when venus is its closest and brightest people are sometimes fooled by it even today but not so much today uh, uh, as it was in the past kevin as always talking to you makes time fly my friend it is uh, truly a uh, time traveling experience when i talk to you first of all thank you so much for coming on the show my friend and we all look forward and i'm talking about everybody listening to the exome broadcast network and watching us on simul tv we all can't wait until you start your show again because you my friend are loved <laughs> thank you very much rob i appreciate the kind words they're the, the the nice part about kind words is they're always the truth. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and in that case, people go out and buy my book so I can earn my 25 cents royalty on each sale. We'll do our best to get it out there, Kevin. Uh, once again, uh, speaking about your books, any new books coming up? I've um, uh, got one coming out in the fall called 1973, and it relates to it relates partially to the Pascagoula abduction, which if there's really abductions, this would be the one. Right. And uh, what was going on in 1973 in, in the world of ufology, which was much more than just the Pascagoula sighting. It'll be out in the fall. I've uh, done a couple of other books. Uh, yeah. The Best of Project Blue book. I did the Level Land book, uh, Understanding Roswell, which is a, mm -hmm. a different kind of take on the Roswell case. So just go to um, Amazon.com and you can find a whole list of the books is under Kevin Randall. And if you're interested in the Vietnam War, look for Eric Helm because I wrote a bunch of action adventure books about uh, my well, not my experiences, but the, the Vietnam War. You know, and it's never too early to start buying Christmas gifts because <laughs> Kevin Randall's books are always great Christmas gifts. <laughs> and birthday presents, too. And, and birthday presents. Uh, let me see. Thanksgiving, you know, because there's no turkeys. And, that's right. Anniversaries and uh, any other day of the week because they make a great read, a reading. Before I go, Kevin, thank you very much for your service and uh, the great things that you did for us while you were over on the other side protecting well, us and uh, making uh, sure that freedom and democracy 
rain. And until the next time I see you, my friend, which I hope won't be so long, take care of yourself. And thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate the time. Uh, anytime, my friend. XO Nation, uh, that's it for this hour. I'll be back on the other side of the news as once again we continue here in the XO from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario. Don't forget, Kevin Randall's books are available on Amazon.com and his website is kevinrandall.blogspot.com. I'm Rob McConnell, Exxon at exxonradiotv.com is the website. And to contact me by, e uh, by email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Catch you on the other side of the news. <laughs>